Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this presentation, a partnership between the Hastings County Historical Society and Belleville Public Library. My name is Shannon Bryan, and I'm a librarian at Belleville Public Library. My co-host from the Historical Society today is Jerry Freyberg. We are here today to hear author Sherry Pringle speak about her book, All the Ship's Men, HMCS Athabascan's Untold Stories. For those of you just joining us, we will be using the chat feature in Zoom for any questions today. So please feel free to type your questions in the chat feature throughout the presentation. I will be monitoring the chat and I will uh, give the questions to Sherry at the end of her presentation. If you have any technical issues or comments, please submit them through the chat feature as well. Without further ado, I pass this along to Jerry, who will introduce our speaker. Thanks, Shannon, and uh, welcome everybody. Uh, technology, what a wonderful thing. It's, uh, it's allowed us to stay in touch through the pandemic. Uh, what would we have done without Zoom? That said, um, you know, things are starting to open up and we're the historical society, we the historical society are starting mm -hmm. to look at the possibility of returning to presentations at Maranatha Church uh, where we'd all be in the same room and have coffee and cookies and cake and that type of thing. But in the meantime, we're here and we're going to make use of the technology. Um, this is an amazing book. Uh, I've just, I've read this. It's available from uh, the Belleville Public Library. I think this might be the only copy it's due today, so I'll be bringing it back. Sherry Pringle's a Napanee native and her interest in an uncle that she never knew led her on an incredible journey of discovery. Young Morris Waitson, her uncle, was killed in World War II when HMCS Athabascan was sunk by enemy fire in the English Channel on April 29, 1944. <laughs> Focusing on the personal stories of her uncle and his comrades, she wrote her first book, All the Ship's Men, HMCS Athabascan's Untold Stories. It was launched in June of 2010 from the flight deck of HMCS Athabascan III, the third uh, ship with the same name in Halifax Harbor. And this followed the opening of an Athabascan display she organized and sent to the Juno Beach Center in France. Her second book, Extraordinary Women, Extraordinary Times, Canadian Women of World War II, was launched in 2015 by Borealis Press. And this was followed in 2020 by a children's book called Grandpa Was a Ram. And it was written and illustrated with the help of her then seven-year-old grandson, Jackson. In 2021, the second edition of All the Ship's Men was published by Lammy Publishing with the edition of 18 New Stories. She has two historical novels written and awaiting publication. Now, Sherry's a member of the writing group County Scribblers, and the Writers' Union of Canada. Currently, she's assisting the Navy erect a citizen sailor virtual cenotaph honoring all sailors of the Canadian Reserve who lost their lives in World War II. And now I turn this over to you, Sherry, and uh, it's a wonderful book, and I think you're in for a wonderful uh, presentation. Here's Sherry Pringle. Thank you very much, Jerry, for your introduction and for the opportunity for me to share HMCS Athabascan, my personal journey in relationship to this World War II tale is synonymous with why it is important to record historical events, not only for ourselves, but for the generations to come. Slide, please. This is a painting I did. I was a, uh, an artist in my first life and um, have been sidetracked down the road of writing. Uh, and this is called Launch Day, obviously. And uh, the ship was launched on uh, the 18th of November, 44, taken away to be outfitted for war and commissioned on February 3rd, 43. Next slide, please. This is also a painting of um, the ship that I have done. Um, there is another one similar to this in France at the moment. Um, the ships were 377 feet long. 
37 and a half feet wide, and they displaced 3,000 tons. Now, Jerry has touched on the fact that um, I have known about the story for a long time, since my childhood. And there was um, a family album that had a photograph of this particular gentleman, Mo Waitson, Morris Waitson. And in it, wearing a naval uniform in front of Big Ben in London. And I would ask my mother who he was. And she'd just say he died in the war. End of story. And basically, the family knew nothing other than the ship sunk and he was gone. He, they really had no details. So fast forward to the year 20, or 2001. And I was working with my husband. And he walked past my desk one April day and tossed a copy of McLean's magazine. And he said, yeah, there's an article in here I think you're going to want to read. And the article was an interview with a couple from Hamilton, Ontario, Bill and Vi Connolly. Bill had survived the sinking of Athabaskan and had been taken prisoner of war. And while he was at war, Vi worked as the Rosie the Riveter in a in a local factory in Hamilton. But the article was preempting an upcoming documentary on Athabasca. So of course my husband and I tuned in on the designated night to watch the documentary. One gentleman who had been interviewed um, was also photographed beside my uncle in the book Unlucky Lady, which was written by Emile Baudouin and Len Burroughs. They were standing together in the same gun crew. The next day, I shut myself into a vacant office, and I began to cold call all the people in Winnipeg by the name of Sulkers, because the domicile at the back of Unlucky Lady said he was from Winnipeg. After a number of these phone calls, I finally reached on a cousin who gave me his phone number and told me he had moved to Vancouver. But prior to that, I was getting responses like, oh, I think he died in the war. And, oh, this is a large family. I, I don't know anybody by that name until I managed to hit the family historian. It was an exciting phone call to Herm Selkers, and I had to wait until noon our time in order to call him uh, in Winnipeg or in, I'm sorry, in Vancouver. You'll meet him later on in the slides. But he led me on a journey of discovery that ended in these two books. It was he who paved the way for me to meet the survivors still with us. I was quickly included in their comings and goings. Several came to meet me and I attended the memorial services at the Haida in Toronto initially and then later in Hamilton. I have traveled to France three times just for the purpose of unearthing information and visiting the sites involving Athabasca. Next slide, please. These are the two Hamilton Bills. And um, Bill Connolly was on the left. He was the gentleman that was also interviewed in the documentary. And his pal was Bill Stewart on the right. They were both signalmen. And during the, um, the sinking, after the sinking of the ship, it was discovered that Bill Stewart was classified as missing, presumed dead, and Bill Connolly on the left became a prisoner of war. Next slide. So Bill Stewart, uh, the, who was the gentleman on the right, was a fabulous artist, and he designed the logo, the motto, the motto of which was, we, we fight as one. But for his model to use to make the uh, Indian on the Pinto, he used his pal Bill Connolly as a model. Next slide. This is the last known photograph of the ship's company. And I'll tell you a little bit later about it. I wish I could show you, um, point to where my uncle is. I now know, but I didn't for a long time. HMCS Athabascan was one of four Canadian tribal class destroyers. And they were all built at Newcastle on Tyne in England. For the simple fact 
that Halifax Shipyard couldn't accommodate because of their size at 377 feet long. They were outfitted in the most advanced of technologies and they came with a hefty price tag of $2 million a piece. The four ships, Iroquois, Haida, Huron and Athabascan, were in various stages of construction in the shipyard when an airstrike heavily damaged Iroquois. Now the Navy had already advertised and it was through announcements that Iroquois was designated to be the first launch. So they took the ship designated as Athabascan and changed her name to Iroquois and the damaged Iroquois became Athabasca. So as we said earlier, she was launched on November the 18th, 1941, and commissioned on February 3rd of 43. On that day, a cat nonchalantly accompanied the newly commissioned crew of sailors up the gangway. Ginger became the ship mascot and accompanied them on all of their missions. The new Athabascan was soon to live up to the superstitions surrounding the changing of a ship's name. She was to become an unlucky lady. During her 14 month war service, she sustained stress damage due to the extreme cold of the Arctic waters. She sustained damage from colliding with a steel cable at the mouth of the port at Scapa Flow. And for these mishaps, she was out of commission for repairs. And then the summer of 1943 arrived while they were patrolling the Bay of Biscay. She suffered a severe damage after being struck by a radio controlled glider bomb nicknamed Chase Me Charlie. And for that, she was out of commission for three months. During the attack, five seamen were killed and buried at sea, and 12 were wounded. Mission missions were carried out in the Faroes Islands, Scapa Flow, the Murmansk Run, and the Bay of Biscay, before she and her sister ships were relocated to Plymouth to, to join the 10th Flotilla. On the evening of April the 26th, 1944, the 10th was escorting mine layers preparing the channel for the Normandy invasion when they encountered three German e-boats. On this night, gunfire erupted and the Haida and Athabascan sunk one of the German, German Elbing destroyers T-29. Two nights later, on April the 28th, Haida and Athabascan were ordered to escort mine layers again from the, another night in the channel. But some of the ships were out of commission that were in the 10th flotilla. After having sustained damage from the altercation with the three Elbings two nights earlier. So on this night, Haida and Athabascan were the sole support force for the mine layers. As they untied from Canada Boy, Ginger the cat leapt over to Haida. The sailors tossed her back. She had been spending a lot more time in recent days hanging out amongst the Haidans, and the Athabascans noted it as an omen. In the wee hours of the morning on April the 29th, the mine layers had completed their mission and were already heading back to port in Plymouth. When Athabascan and Haida received word from Central Command that blips on the radar indicated two enemy vessels were ghosting the shore of Brittany. They were T-24 and T-29, the remaining two ships from the naval battle two nights previously on April 26. The tribals opened fire on the enemy. Haida had recently been issued with flashless cordite, so the enemy couldn't see her gunfire. 
The enemy then turned their focus to Athabascan, which did not have the latest in the Cordite technology. At 4.17 a.m., before the break of dawn, Athabascan was struck by an enemy torpedo, which decimated her Y guns. Commander DeWolf of the Haida ordered a smoke screen cover laid over Athabascan and took off to chase the enemy. Haida ran T-27, that's the second of the Elbings, up onto the rocky coast of Brittany and returned to the scene of the disaster. Meanwhile, Captain Stubbs on Athabascan had ordered abandoned ship. As there was a second explosion and she sunk at 428, a total time of 11 minutes. When Heidi returned to search for survivors, the, ships, the ship was gone from the surface. There was nothing but debris and bobbing lights in the water. From the helmets worn by the sailors, they had, um, they had a helmet that had a chin strap on it. And if you tugged on it, there was a little light on the top of their helmet that was activated. So all they could see were all these bobbing lights, no ship, but the sailors clinging to life on the ship's flotsam. Central in command ordered Hyde home as dawn was breaking. And it was felt that she too would be vulnerable for this time for an airstrike in retaliation for the two lost e-boats. Haida rescued 44 sailors. She let down her Carly floats and a cutter, which rescued another six Athabascans. When they left for port in Plymouth, there were still 211 Athabascans adrift on the frigid, frigid Atlantic. Haida had stayed 18 minutes to rescue those men. HMCS Athabascan had sailed from port that night with a complement of 261 sailors. Haida and her cutter had rescued a total of 50. The enemy, including T-24, the very ship that destroyed Athabascan, returned hours later in daybreak and scoop 83 from the sea to become prisoners of war. 128 sailors died. 91 bodies washed ashore in nine different locations on Brittany's shore, and 37 bodies were never recovered. Next slide. This is the painting that I had done. After talking to um, Herm Sulkers, who I told you I'd tracked down, he was my first contact. And he had said to me, I would love for you to paint this image that I have in my mind of the ship it was sinking. The image that I can see from my vantage point in the water. So the funny thing is that this is not the, um, the copy that was used for the book. I had um, rendered this and I loved it. And my husband said, Sherry, it's too perpendicular. Well, the sailors all told me that that's the way it went. It just went up on it. The stern was blown off. It went up on it some, with its bow in the air and it went straight down. So we, I called in an expert. I called in a friend who was a former um, a submarine commander in the Cold War. And he looked at it. He said, I have to agree with um, him, Sherry, but it is too perpendicular. So I painted the same scene a second time and I changed the angle. So this, that copy that you're looking at now is the one that I actually have. It's never been signed. And the other one has a different angle. The coloring is a little bit different, but that was the one used in the cover. Herm Sulkers had, had told me he wanted me to paint this but he didn't live to see it. So on the original book cover the, of the first All the Ships Men that Jerry just showed you, there's a little box with three um, head shots on it. The first one on the left is um, the Commander Stubbs, John Stubbs, and the middle one is Herm Sulkers. 
and the one on the right was my uncle Morris Waitson. Next slide, please. Harry Hurwitz. Harry was the only Jewish sailor taken prisoner of war from the ship. There were some uh, huff duff operators, but they did not survive. So Harry was the only Jewish gentleman picked up. And when he was in the water and he, they, the men could see the ships coming back in daylight, coming slowly to see what was going on on the surface. When they got closer and it, it, they recognized them as German vessels. And of course, the one that had come back was T-24, the one, the very ship that had sunk Athabasca. Harry threw his dog tag in the sea. And he gave, he listed his name as being Herwitt, W-I-T-T. -T. He had dropped the Z. He was whisked off to a prisoner of war camp at Mileg and Marleg uh, camps in northern Germany. Next slide, please. This is my friend Herm. Herm was my first contact with the Athabasca Network, and he was a terrific athlete. And he thought for certain he was going to be able to swim to shore. The men could all see the flashing light from the Finisterre lighthouse, five miles off in the distance. But the cold was too debilitating. It was, it was measured at something like um, 58 degrees Fahrenheit. He had also become a prisoner of war until the camp was liberated almost a year to the day after taken prisoner. I met Teddy Hewitt at a reunion and a memorial service in Haida at, um, in Hamilton. And he told me that he was friends of my uncle Morris and that they had found one another in the water af after abandoning ship and began to swim frantically towards the Haida who'd come back to the rescue. But Mo yelled to him and said he couldn't make it and told him to go on. Teddy was the very last sailor rescued by Haida. It was not easy to do this because they were men were all covered in bunker oil and they kept slipping off the off the scramble net. But um, so he he survived the war, was rescued and returned home. And Mo was classified as MPD, which is missing, presumed dead. John Fairchild on the left and Morris Waitson on the right. John and Morris were amongst the youngest on board ship. John never knew what happened to his, his friend Mo. He, hadn't, he didn't know what had actually happened to him at the very end. But he had a, he'd been carrying a burden of guilt on his shoulders for decades. And it seems that Mo was stationed on B guns at the bow of the ship. And John was on X guns at the stern and Mo begged him to switch gun detail with him. And the reason being was because it was cold at the bow. Sometimes on the merman's run and the waves would, would wash over the, the, the front deck and their great coats would freeze to the deck. And he just wanted, he wanted to reprieve from that. So the two of them went to Captain Stubbs who agreed with the gun switch, which took place the 1st of April. So the first of the, the only torpedoes struck between X and Y guns. In April of 2014, celebrating the 70th anniversary of the sinking, the veterans were all too elderly to travel. So I went with a team of eight other Athabascan family members. And we paid homage to the Athabascans in place of the loved ones who could not attend. John Fairchild's son, Peter, took me by the hand and over to a, a, a the big photograph of the, the last known photo of the ship's crew and pointed out his father. Well, I had been looking forever with a magnifying glass and I couldn't 
distinguish which one was Morris. But as soon as he pointed out his dad, of course, the two of them were standing together under the forward gun. Next slide, please. <clears throat> this case was particularly tragic, as they all were, of course, but Lieutenant Leslie Ward had just arrived in England to temporarily replace the head of naval information in London. But Ward wanted to write about the new tribal. So he and, and, and a photographer, sub-Lieutenant Mahoney, Jack Mahoney, raced across the dockyards to catch the ship's untying on the night of April the 28th. Neither men were regular crew. They were just visiting on that night. And they had the choice of which ship they wanted to travel with. And they decided that they'd go with Athabaskan because it was younger than Ida. They were last seen, both of them, at the, on the bridge when Athabaskan was struck by the torpedo. Mahoney's body washed ashore up to a scat and Ward is classified as MPD. The forward guns. The ship's wreck was not discovered until the fall of 2002. It was not discovered in the coordinates provided by the Navy. It was about a mile off. But it was discovered by French archae marine archaeologist uh, Jacques Ojeka. So in July, the next uh, you know, months later, in July of 2003, two veterans, a handful of family members, second and third generation, including myself and my husband, Larry, a naval historian, marine, marine architect, and five expert divers, um, were invited to accompany Canadian filmmaker Wayne Abbott, who was going to France to... Um, perform, uh, perform the dive and document the second documentary. Now, rumors had abounded for years that a second explosion had caused, was caused by a torpedo strike, but not due to enemy strike, but by friendly fire. Theory had it, and a lot of them believed this, that the second explosion was from a torpedo that was accidentally fired by one of the fleeing MTBs going back to um, England port. And because the Athabascan wreck lies in almost 300 feet of water, and due to its dangerous currents, there's a very fine timeline that they could actually perform the dive. It was a dangerous mission to send divers even down to the wreck. Time-wise, there was a very small window of opportunity to examine and film and to note any evidence to support the friendly fire theory. Upon close examination of the photos taken, no indication of a second torpedo's entry was found. The ship's boilers, the ship was lying on its side and the ship's boilers were still intact. At the site, a thought to be the purported point of entry, so the theory was unfounded. So there's the diver on the left. They had a special, it was the limit to um, how deep uh, a diver could go in a regular scuba outfit. They had special um, mixture of gases to do this. And there were something like five divers. There was a couple from Britain, one from the US and a uh, Canadian. And this, the, the um, image on the right is just part of the wreck that was noted. The stern was never found. It had been blown off. So on the left here, we have Peter Ward and Mark Ward. So Peter is the son, was the son of Lieutenant Leslie Ward, who had just been on the ship just for a few hours before it was sunk. And he traveled to France with his son, so Les's grandson, Mark. And Mark was one of the divers. 
He had to take special training to dive to that depth. And he had the honor of placing the brass plaque provided by the Navy to lay against the, um, the keel on the, sh on the ship at the bottom of the sea. Next, please. Lieutenant Dun Lanchier was one of the POWs. And it was determined that the, the bodies had washed ashore in nine different locations along Brittany's coast. But at Pluscat, where the most um, number of men had washed ashore, being the number being 59, they were all thrown into a mass grave. So at war's end, it was actually 1947, Lanchier got permission from ambassador to France, Vanier, and he traveled over and they excavated the grave, were able to identify um, uh, 34 of the 59, and the other, um, the other 25 were not um, able to be identified, but they were all interred, reinterred individually now. This is what a marker looks like this, for an unknown soldier or MPD, missing, presumed dead. It says, known unto God. Commander John Stubbs was the second captain of Athabascan. The first one wasn't very popular. And they moved him out and they brought in Captain Stubbs. He was much loved. He was alive in the water and helping Teddy Hewitt up the scramble net. And Haida's commander, DeWolf, Harry DeWolf, yelled at Stubbs to save himself. Get up the ladder and save yourself. But the 31-year-old declined. And he just yelled, waved and yelled, get out of here, Haida, get clear. And he chose to remain in the Atlantic with his crew. He is a true naval hero and a legend. In his previous commission as commander of Assiniboine, so at the time he was 31, he was 31 when he died. So when he was 28 or 29 and he was the commander of the Assiniboine, he was awarded the Distinguished Service Order for his bravery in maneuvering his ship through a fog bank with its bridge on fire to sink an enemy sub. His body washed short Puiscat also, where it lies in an unmarked or in a marked grave, excuse me. Next slide. All of the graves are beautifully attended by the locals. Flowers, everybody has flowers. It's wonderful. It's just wonderful to see. And this is Captain Stubbs' marker. The book made its de debut in France, as Jerry already told you, and it was in May of um, 2010, on the occasion of the centennial for the Canadian Navy, uh, for which I had been invited to send um, a, a display. Now, there's nothing left of the ship, so the display included medals and letters and photographs and such. So I traveled to France with my husband and some family and friends where I unveiled the display, which also included the newly released book, which is the, the other one that Jerry held up, and the paintings that graced the front and back cover. So the same painting was used for the front cover. But the museum, the, the uh, Juno Beach Center kept the painting that um, is on the back cover and the front cover painting had been sold. So I had to take it home for its home in Canada. One month later, the book was formally launched by the Navy as, as Jerry told us. And it was for this uh, centennial. And it was the day after, it was the 30th of June, and it was the day after, um, in 2010, 
the day after the queen um, was given the 21 gun salute by Athabascan III. The following Christmas, I received a phone call from John Allman. Now, he's, he was the only German sailor that I had interviewed for the book. He was a lovely and gentle man. And he was very cautious at my intent at interviewing him and for all the shipmen. And when I conveyed to him that I had seen numerous photos of young men in German sailor uniforms, or I had seen photos of German ships in, in um, formation, and even though they spoke a different language and they wore different uniforms, and they were on different sides of the war. They were simply serving their country, just as our young men were asked to do. He told me he didn't know that we were the bad guys. He, we didn't know we were the bad guys. In our initial pleasantries, he said to me, Mrs. Pringle, I need to know something. So he called on Christmas, uh, oh, just a couple of days before Christmas, on the, the just months after the ship had uh, the book had been launched, and he said, "Mrs. Pringle, I need to know something. Did you suffer any repercussions from including me in your book?" And I told him the story of the first reunion the veterans had in Vancouver. They placed an ad in the paper looking for the shipmate. They received a request from a former German naval officer seeking permission to bring another former officer to attend the Athabascans' first reunion. The Athabascans laughed, at the, laughed with them and welcomed them, um, their former foe. And together they drank and they shared stories and they laughed at the antics of their youth. War was over. Bygones were bygones. They had all been doing what young men were required to do, each serving their country. The German officer had been the commander of T-24, the very ship that had sunk Athabascan. So I said to my dear Mr. Ullman, I had asked the other veterans if they would mind if this story was included. Everyone on board was included was was on board for including him. It was time for reconciliation. After the book was launched, more Athabascan family members surfaced. They come for the same reason that I did, to find people who might have known their loved one. In March of 2021, just a year ago now, the second edition was published with 18 new stories for a total now of 48. One story that emerged by serendipity was that of Stuart Cooney from Belleville, who married a Scottish lass. I'd heard of his name from Belleville, but I couldn't find a contact for him. And it turns out he'd married a Scottish lass when their ship had been in port in Scotland. A baby girl was born just weeks prior to the last mission. Cooney never had an opportunity to meet his daughter and he was missing presumed dead. Another story that came forward was just last year was that of the second in command of the ship, First Lieutenant Ralph Lawrence, who also fell in love with a Scottish gal when Athabascan was in port there. But when the ship moved to port in Plymouth, he got a 48-hour pass, traveled by train to Scotland, so you know it must have taken almost the whole day to get to Glasgow, married his fiance and returned to, um, to his duty on board ship. And he was lost when the ship sunk. They had literally spent one married night together. And still the stories come. Family seeking connection with others of the Athabascan network. This April the 28th marks the 78th anniversary of the disaster that occurred five weeks prior to the Normandy invasion and five days prior to my Uncle Mo's 20th birthday. And still they come. Are there any questions? 
Oh, thank you, Sherry. That was lovely. Um, we're going to go to questions now. So if you have any questions or comments for Sherry, you can use the chat feature, um, probably located at the bottom of your screen. I think Jerry might have a question for Sherry. Well, uh, yeah, I, I have a couple of questions. First of all, I, one thing I should, uh, for those of you uh, who are not familiar with the Athabascan, from the um, from the back of the book, uh, I'll read this quote, the sinking of the Athabascan is the worst naval disaster in Canadian history, and for that reason alone, it should never be forgotten. Sherry Pringle has captured the true essence of this very dramatic story in this book. It's heartfelt and gives a beautiful and honest look at the true horrors and true heroes of war. And that's by Wayne Abbott, the documentarian from North, Northern Sky Entertainers and Entertainments. Uh, Sherry, I'm just curious from a technical point of view, having worked myself in, in, uh, in, in news media for 20 years, uh, I recorded a lot of interviews. So I was just wondering how, how you captured that information. I guess it was a lot of telephone calls. Um, did you record them or did, do you know yes. shorthand? Or? Uh, well, most of them are longhand. Actually, some of them were recorded. Um, I, I was privy to friendships with a lot of the survivors at the time. There was still a number left. And no one, you know, they were all for what I was doing and they were eager to help. So I was able to get um, information from them themselves and their memories. Um, the gentlemen who were had passed away in the war, uh, that information came from their family members. So, um, and, and that's why Cooney, it was... Um, it was difficult to find him, and, and I was at HMCS Cataraqui, and I saw they have a, a wall of honor of which they have a photograph of all the ships in the war, of which Canadian men in eastern Ontario from, say, Whitby to, you know, the border um, were uh, served in. And um, so I saw Cooney's, this is the most incredible story. I saw Stuart Cooney, and so his, his story there, his brief blurb, and so I was going to, I, I was coming to Belleville to work in Gallery 121 on the Tuesday. And that was the Saturday was in, I was in um, uh, Kingston. So I would no sooner put the sandwich board outside and I was going to go in and call the gentleman um, that I knew who had written that story to ask him who the contact was. When in the door walked a lady and we struck up a conversation and I had invited her to sit a while and and I asked her her name. And guess what her name was? Her last name was Cooney. Mm -hmm. And I asked her if she uh, was related. And she said, yes, a distant relative. So she's the one that told me that there had been a baby born that he had never seen. So they, they um, yeah, they, they were eager to help me out. And um, most of the information came uh, firsthand or from the families. Um. Yeah. Sorry, Sorry, go ahead, Sherry. <laughs> yeah, I, I just had one other comment uh, in reading the stories. Uh, there's a thread that seems to run through uh, the uh, the families that uh, the night of the sinking, several of the family members woke up or had dreams or saw apparition, apparitions. They knew that yeah. their sons were gone, and I, that struck me. And it, uh, I, I must confess, I'm not a religious man, but um, there's something. What, what, did, 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 what, what are your thoughts on that? Well, um, number one, we, my grandmother, uh, Morris's mother, fell out of bed screaming that Morris was dead um, in the, you know, like at 10, 11 o'clock at night, which would have been four in the morning over in France. And um, so we'd already, we'd heard that story. And it seems to me, it's almost as if people were more in tune with one another back all, all those years ago, because we didn't have instant communication. Yeah. There were so many stories like that. I thought ours was the, the unique one. And Peter Ward yeah. told me that he'd been in the movie theater with his mother in Ottawa. His mother grabbed him by the hand and before the end of the movie and bolted from the theater, dragging 
Peter out and Peter says, well, the, the movie's not over. And he's, she says, we have to go because something has happened. Yeah. And also the, the funny thing was with the cat. And I had written that in that the cat had um, been spending more time with a with the Hydens and that tried to jump ship a couple of times and they kept tossing her back. And the editor called me and said, you can't put this in the book. This is utter nonsense. And I said, give me 24 hours and I'll get right back to you. So I called, I got off the phone and I called my vet. And I said, this is what I'm doing. What do you think? He says, oh, he says, it's a common. It's, it, it's known, it's a widely known thing. He says, in countries where there are tsunamis and such, he said, the animals that are not tied up always head for the high ground. It's like they have an innate sense. But yes, it did happen. I'll bet I've got four or five recorded stories of that. So it's interesting you say that we're people were more in tune. Um, I, I think we all have this radar built in. Um, we uh, perhaps you know these these computers, uh, television, all the technology perhaps has has taken us away from all of that. Uh, I agree. I agree. Shannon. Um, yeah, we have a question through our chat. It's from Sandy. Uh, asking where can you buy the book? Does the Friends of Hada gift shop have this available for purchase? And if not, can I get our gift shop manager in contact with you? Yes, I'm glad you brought that up because I, they were in contact with me recently. And, and um, yes, you should be able to get it through them. I can also drop one in the mail. Um, if you go on my website, which is simply sherrypringle.com, or um, you can um, contact me and I will, I can drop one in the mail, but I do intend to get them to hide. I've been lax, I must say, with the pandemic. I haven't uh, done my due diligence to get it out there, but yes, I can get it. I can get you a copy. It might be sherrypringle.ca. Oh, yes, I have both of those. Oh, I okay. I, I found CA. CA. Yeah, I have both. So. Okay. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Is there any other questions from any of our uh, audience members? You can use the chat feature. Um, to chat here, uh, Sherry, did you want me to provide your email address or just your? Yes, website you can. Do, you can. You're welcome to share my email address. And it's Shilu two thousand and five, right? Mm hmm. At Yahoo. Yeah, that's right. And again, this uh, Sherry's book, the first edition, is available in the Belleville Public Library. Uh, well, it will be as soon as I bring it back. Mm -hmm. But um, yes. it's I highly recommend it. It's, uh, it's the, the tales are quite gripping, and uh, you know it's it's wonderful to to document that. Good, thank you for doing that. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say that that first edition is out of print now. Okay. So if you get the second edition, it's got more new stories, right? It's got more new stories. Oh, oh we've got someone else here. Uh, Louise, just wanted to say that your presentation was emotional and touching. Real life and wartime, thank you. That's absolutely true. Okay, so thank you very much, Sherry, for um, speaking with us today. Pleasure. We really appreciate it. And I will be looking into getting the second edition for the library, so don't worry about that. Um, and Jerry, I don't know if you have any closing remarks. Yeah, well, I just wanted to add that if, if uh, you wanted to see this again, or if you know anybody who would like to hear this uh, presentation, uh, it has been recorded and it will be on the Hastings County Historical Society uh, YouTube channel within a couple of days. Uh, there will likely be a link on our website. Um, so you can uh, pass that information along. Sherry, thank you very much for your time and, and joining us and, and presenting this, this amazing story. Uh, also, uh, as I said at the, at the beginning, uh, we are hoping to uh, start doing live presentations again at Maranatha Church, but 
this pandemic, uh, uh, we've been told it's over, but it ain't over yet. Um, <laughs> you know, there's, there's people still coming down with COVID. So we'll, we'll pay attention to that, but hopefully uh, we will be able to uh, get back to our live presentations and uh, watch our website and social media for, for news on that. Sherry, on behalf of the Hastings County Historical Society, thank you very much. Wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Sherry. Everyone have a great afternoon.